Welcome back to Crafted Entrepreneur. In this episode, I'm joined by real estate investor, mentor, and HGTV personality, Jenna Hoover. Jenna and I talk about how she pivoted from going into the medical field to real estate, what got her on HGTV, and her experience in everything from flipping homes to owning multifamily, and now even owning short-term rentals. So we go into the biggest mistakes she made as a new investor, what advice she'd give her younger self, and what role you should be playing in the deal according to your strengths. I think you're really gonna love it. Let's listen. excited because we get to have one of my friends on the show to talk about real estate. And we actually met at a networking event or a mastermind, I think it was. And I'm like so awkward in social situations where I don't know anybody because I don't do small talk at all. And Jenna found me and saved me basically and came and talked to me. And I was like, yay, (laughs) I found a friend, which, you know, I always talk about going outside of your comfort zone and doing those things. But her talking to me at that event got me outside of my comfort zone to then go and make relationships with other people too. So I don't think I've gotten the chance to say thank you, but thank you, Jenna. We're excited because today Jenna Hoover is on the podcast. She is an amazing real estate investor, mentor, HGTV personality, and we're going to talk about all things real estate today. So Jenna, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. And I'm, I'm glad that you think I saved you at the event. I was kind of, I kind of thought I was like a little stalkerish. So as long as you thought it was something positive, because I, I remember I was looking at our our book of all the different people that were attending and I'm like, I need to meet her. Like, she <laughs> seems so cool. And it's like, I felt like you were my spirit animal. Like, I'm like, <laughs> if I could be anybody when I grow up, it's this girl. So that's who I want to meet. So that's why I sought you out and found you. And there we were. But OK, so this is just so smart, though, because it took intentionality to like, first of all, go through and say, who do I want to meet at this event? And then to just be bold, to go up and be like, hey, what's up? I want to meet you. You know, I think that I used to be like that. And then I get inside of my comfort zone and I just stopped doing things like that. And you're inspiring me to do more. So I'm really, it's we'll, really awesome. We'll go to an event together and we'll just go up and meet everybody. <laughs> yes. Okay. I like that. You'll be my uh, safety, my safety blanket or whatever you call it. My yeah. comfort blanket. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that sounds great. Okay, so what I love, Jenna, we have some things in common. You started out in the medical field. You went to school for radiology, but you never really did anything with it. And now you're in real estate. I was a nurse and I did that for a little bit, but now I'm in the real estate game as well. How did you get from that, like thinking you're going to be in the medical field to doing what you do today? Well, I did work somewhat in the medical field. So I did medical sales for about seven years. So I didn't really do, I spent a whole lot of time like actually taking x-rays. So I went to school for radiology, got into medical sales. I kind of like joked that I drank from the golden chalice, like really young. So I was like 20 years old, making six figures, doing great with things. But I just didn't wake up every day with this like conviction of like, yes, I get to do this for the rest of my life. Like it, 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 I mean, and in my area, like six figures, like that was, you know, something that was like, oh my gosh, like who, we don't know anybody who makes that like in this small little Pennsylvania town. So, I mean, it was great for me, but I just, I didn't have like the love for the career. And so kind of like fast forward, I went through some different, you know, relationship changes and things like that. And I always loved real estate. Like I saw if I, if I would watch a show on TV, I'm like, I'm painting my kitchen cabinets black today. (laughs) You know, like I would just be like that person that would just be wild and crazy. I just loved everything about real estate, the transformations, except I didn't know anything about anything. Like I didn't know anything about it. I can even like remember like, I didn't even know what the word escrow meant when I first started learning like real estate terms, but kind of like fast forward. Um, I had some different setbacks career wise, things like that. I ended up working for a doctor in you know, in the Pittsburgh area for about four or five months, like running his entire pulmonary, like, um, he was a pulmonologist. So I ran his whole clinic and he was a primary care physician. But then I just, I decided, you know what, I went to the gym one day and ad popped up for a real estate education company. And it was talking about a free event. I'm like, heck, like, what do I have to lose? And so that kind of like is what started me from, you know, radiology to highs and lows and everything in between to here's where I am. Wow. Okay. So it's interesting because we all have these like different journeys. And when we're in the journey, 
and we have these twists and turns, we don't think it's going to turn out as good as it turns out, right? Because we're like, oh, why is this happening to me? And like, it always turns out so much better. So I just want to point that out to somebody that might be listening in right now that's in a twist, you know, the plot twist of their life. Use Jenna as like that inspiration that she could be for you, that it's going to turn out like so much better than you can even imagine right now. So you get into real estate and how do you think being in the medical field, right? Like the medical sales field, how did that prepare you to be successful in real estate? Like what skills did you already have? I think like being in the medical sales, like I was used to kind of like the work from home. I'm my own boss. I have to be self-motivating. I have to be disciplined. Like a lot of that stuff carried over because a lot of people think like, oh, I just can't wait to be my own boss. And then I can just sit at home all day. And all they do is sit at home all day then, (laughs) you know, like they don't do anything. They get lazy and then they don't make an income and then they feel like a failure. So I had a lot of that, like, I'm not used to a boss breathing down my neck. So being an entrepreneur is, I mean, it was basically the same thing. It just, I didn't have to report to a boss like once a week or something like that. And I was fine with that. So I was fine with the face-to-face interaction. I was fine with sales. I was fine with negotiating. I was fine with a lot of that type of stuff. It's just, I didn't know anything about real estate, like terminology, or how do you walk into a house and say, oh, it's going to cost 30,000 to fix it. Or how do you talk to a contractor and not have them like give you some crazy number for a roof? Or, I mean, there was just, I didn't know contracts or just even terminology. It just, it felt like it was just a different language. So the things that I have going for me was that I was aggressive. I was young. When I got into real estate, I think I was like 26 years old. So there was a lot of like, I had no idea what to be scared of even in my head. So when you can just like, you know, it's like a lot of times when people say like, you know, don't look down when you look down is when you fall, you're fine beforehand, but it was just like when you took your eyes off or whatever. And so that's how I was. Like I got, I was almost like a, like a golden retriever when you threw a ball. Like I didn't see anything else but the finish line and the, or that ball. And so, I mean, yeah, I screwed up a, a whole lot different times at different things, but I didn't even know what I could be scared of. So a lot of that helped, I'd say. Oh, I love that. I like to call it ignorance on fire because you just, you really don't know what you don't know and you don't know how bad it can be. So you just keep going and you run into the fire. But then what happens is like, you have all of these tricks for putting out fires now because you've (laughs) made all of the mistakes. What would you say is like the biggest mistake you made early on in your real estate investing career? I'd say like the biggest mistake I think was being in so much competition with other people or even myself. Because whenever I got into it, like I invest in a really small area in Southwestern Pennsylvania. So I don't have really a lot of investor competition. And it's a very like, it's one of the poor counties in Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of distressed properties, a lot of motivated sellers. So it was kind of like shooting fish in a barrel. And you know, my coaches would be like, go out there, guys, make 10 offers and see what happens. And I'm like, okay, there's like six properties that are pretty good deals. I'll make all six offers. And I'd make all six and all six got accepted. Cause I didn't really have anybody to compete with, which is great, but not because then it's like, well, these are all really good deals. I don't want to say no to them. And then I wouldn't have a team big enough to handle the volume of six properties or, you know, I may wholesale one of them. I may keep one as a rental, but then the rest, I'm like, well, what the heck, what do I do with? And so in the beginning I moved forward on five out of those six properties. And that's where it's just like, it was like zero to 60 so quick. And so there was a lot of things I didn't have time to learn along the way, but then because it was so like, I guess not necessarily, not necessarily eye catching, but it was so like out of the norm to see this young 26 year old girl who's a single mom, who's flipping like five different houses at at any given time. And it, and it caught the attention of a lot of people and, you know, like social media and a lot of like, you know, HGTV stuff. And so then it became like, okay, everybody thinks I'm here, but I'm still this brand new baby investor. So I would go to like these different networking events and people would be like, oh my gosh, I just want to be like you when I, you know, like whatever. And I'm like, seriously, I am hoping that my credit card goes through for this event, you know, like in the beginning. So I'm like, like, I mean, I was just so brand new and so struggling and trying to make it happen. But, you know, everybody on social media creates their own image and they just think like, you know, something different. So it was so hard because like to live up to everybody's expectations But to do things and do them right was the hard part because I was so overwhelmed with 
so many roles, so many responsibilities, so many projects. And, and then also in the beginning, people were attracted to you like flies, you know what I mean? Like, so people were all like wanting to be part of whatever you are. So I would have a ton of people that want to partner. And I got scammed over by a couple on a couple projects with this group that wanted to partner with me. And they ended up putting liens on the property and then wanted refinanced out and took all the funds that we had for rehab. And it was just a mess. So like, there was just a lot of things that like, if I could go over and like, just kind of sit down and be like, here's all the things that I wouldn't do. Obviously, yeah, I would fix a lot of things, but also the stuff I learned, I also wouldn't be here had I not learned them. So it was good. I learned it then versus now kind of a thing, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. There was so much in that, that I, I need to unpack it because people are, I, I'm always interested in people's failures more than their wins because you learn so much from them. Right. Oh yeah. So, okay. You get these properties under contract. And how, did they end up selling like, and you making a profit? What happened with that original, like five out of six that you, you went through with? So this was like 10 years ago. So I'm just like, so I know I was able to keep one as a rental for a while. Then I ended up selling it a couple of years, like years ago, I was able to wholesale one of them. And then the other three, I flipped them. So the first one, I was so fortunate, like on the first property that I ever bought and flipped and sold, I bought it, flipped it, sold it with, I, I flipped it within five weeks. And then I had my buyer, I found my buyer in seven hours on Facebook marketplace for that house. And I sold it and I made $37,000. And because of that, it landed me on like an infomercial for the real estate education company that I was part of. Like it was a really good deal. I really lucked into it. Yeah. It was great because of them, but a lot of it was like total luck. I mean, it was like that perfect deal where it was like, the woman calls you. It's like, I just need out of it. There's no mortgage. It's still really great of a place. So I did really great with that one. Then another one, I, I bought it. It was a duplex made into a single family. And a lot of times, you know, people's like, you have a lot of naysayers in the beginning. And I remember my brother in the beginning, he's like, why are you buying all these houses, all these duplexes and flipping them and selling them? You're crazy. Like nobody's going to buy them, blah, blah, blah. My buyer from my second house was my brother. So he ended up buying the house that I flipped. That was a, a stupid idea. So he lives and actually I flipped then the one next door to it, another duplex. I live in that. So my brother and I are neighbors in two houses that I flipped. So it's super cool. That's um, amazing. Yeah. I so love like we that just walk story. The parking lot, like, and we each have two kids. So like our kids would just like, you know, just trot across the parking lot, heading over to each other's houses, which Aww. is super fun. You know, it's great for my parents and stuff. So, and then the, the next one, I ended up flipping it. And it was one that I kind of went over budget because again, by that time, I was so behind on trying to finish everything else that I was doing that I like made all these last minute changes after I already had my rehab budget. And I ended up like ripping the roof off, retrusting it, doing all these things that were just like an over improvement, but I did sell it. I did make a profit, you know, so they were all, they all turned out great, but I mean, it was so stressful. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I always like to say, no matter what you do, you should enjoy the grind along the way. Like, you know, have fun while you're doing it. Like I just didn't, like I was miserable the whole way. It's just, it was like, you know, get everything done. And you know, then it was like breathe afterwards kind of a yeah. scenario. I think a lot of people are like that in the beginning because you're thinking about all the things that can go wrong, especially when you have investors money tied up and stuff too. You're thinking about all the things that could go wrong and it's not as fun because you're focused on the wrong thing. And we've got to switch our focus now to like, okay, what are the things that are going right in this? Like, what can I do better? You know, the quality of our journey is compared to the quality of the questions we ask ourselves along the way. And so knowing that, like, what do you think, what questions could you have asked yourself in those hard moments where it was like, I just want to get done with this to make it more enjoyable. I think it's not necessarily maybe, maybe not just questions, but things I wish I would have known. Like I wish I would have known better on how to estimate things, plan things, prepare for things. So the question Um, maybe would have been to the mentor. Yeah. I mean, I I think so. I think that I was just doing too, too many things all at the same time and trying to, like, I always like to say, like, you can't be everybody's everything. And it's like, I was trying to be this person, that person doing all these things, flipping all these houses, being a savior for all these people that need to sell a mom to my daughter, you know, a daughter to my parents, like trying to be all these different things. And so because of that, it made it very stressful. You know, you don't want to be on your phone if you're on the phone all day, you know, like you don't want to talk to your friends because you were on the phone all day. You don't want to be on a zoom because you were on zooms all day, like things like that. So 
I think that I, I wish I would have been better prepared and better planned so that that way, and it's kind of like if you go on vacation, it's like if you decide the like the day of to start packing, it sucks to, until you get there. Mm-hmm. But then if you would have been planning for the week and start like doing laundry and start putting your beach towels aside and start you know packing all your stuff, then the day of it's more stressful and you can enjoy and sing like 99 bottles of beer on the wall on the way there, you know, <laughs> and you don't want to just punch your kids because you're just they're annoying you. You know what I mean? So it's like it's just kind of like that. So there are so many different types of real estate to dive into. And you started by flipping houses. You wholesaled some of them. Now you've got short-term rentals. You're in all of it. What type of real estate would you say is your actual like specialty? Well, my favorite, which isn't always like, doesn't always make sense in my area because it's important to know your market, know what sells, know your price range. Like my favorite, if I could just have unlimited funds and not have to worry about budgets and things like that. I love historic renovations. Ooh. Like we did a house a couple years ago, maybe it was like a year or two ago. Um, it was the oldest house in our entire area of this one part of our town. So it was like 120 years old. I mean, it had like the, you know, like the old time door, you know, like the doorknobs and like the, you know, all the really cool stuff, like pocket doors and the skeleton keys and, you know, all the hardwood floors. And like, that's my favorite. Like I love doing that kind of stuff. But as of right now, I think the thing that I'm like really like drawn to that's really sexy for me is all the stuff that's like challenging my brain because it feels like I can flip a house, like, you know, rehab a house, like I can go and wholesale property. I can do all these different things, but I want to get the properties where it's like, here's this deal. How do I figure this out? Like, what's the way to make it work? Like, how do we wrap something around or how do we do creative financing or how do we do subject to, or, you know, how do we, how do we do these different lease options or doing these things that are like in the beginning, I would have been like, what are these words? Mm -hmm. So now it's kind of like, it's fun because I, I like the challenge of figuring out, you know, this deal, I would have just thrown it away or not even called them back because I couldn't like, it didn't make financial sense. But now it's fun for me because it's like, what way can I structure this in a way that nobody else would have thought of that's going to make a ton of sense and profit and be great for everybody. So that's what I'm into now. Oh, I love that. I love your, you like the challenge. So talk to everybody that's listening in right now. When you said the words creative financing, it might be a buzzword. I think more people are making reels and TikToks around it, you know, so people have maybe heard a little bit more about that if they're into real estate, but can you kind of summarize what creative financing is? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically for you to take on a property that isn't traditional financing. So for example, like I just bought a a rental property, a triplex, and they wanted like $90,000 for it. And so it's like, okay, I could just buy it for $90,000, call it a day. Or I can basically see, you know, do you have a mortgage on it, Mr. or Mrs. Seller? If it's no, okay, well, now you have no mortgage. Do you, or do you really need the 90,000 right now? Or how about I give you 10,000 now or, you know, whatever. And then we can basically structure it to where I'm paying X amount every single month for so many months. And then I have a balloon payment or do something like that. So basically I was able to structure this deal. Can't remember all the details. It's been a couple of months since I bought it, but it's basically, I think I put like 10 months down. So I put $10,000 down. And then what I did is I have 0% financing for five years. So basically I'll be, you know, what 60, I think it's like $60,000. And so then basically at the end of the five years, then I have my payoff of like, what is like 20 left or something like that. So I basically would just either refinance it or pay it off. So instead of me going and looking for financing and doing all this stuff, like, yeah, I had to put 10 K down or whatever, but you know, you don't have to put 10 K down. Like I could have just said, Hey, we're just going to do zero. I mean, like they agreed to 0% interest for five years. Like that's insane. Like, I mean, it's great for me, but that's what they did. Or I had somebody that wanted to sell their house, but they're like, I just don't, you know, I just don't want to take on these payments. I don't want to occupy it. Okay. Well, I'll just take over your payments and we'll leave it the way it is. And I'll take the deed of the property and buy it subject to, so subject to your existing mortgage. So I didn't have to get a mortgage. I just took over theirs and I got the deed to the property. So in either one of those scenarios, I didn't have to go find a lender. I didn't have to deal with a bank. I didn't have to do all those crazy things, but people don't think, and it's, it's all based again on your negotiating. Like I can basically say, I'm going to give you 70,000 or we can do your full 90, but here's how we're going to structure it. And I'm the one, I'm the one that's in control. I'm the one that's going to like make the the terms of it. So you you just got to find out what do they really want? And then how can I make it work in my favor as well? Mm -hmm. 
I love that because in people's minds, if they've never done creative financing, it's like, why would somebody do that? Like, why would somebody do that? And could you tell us like in that triplex case, what was, maybe you don't have to tell us specific details, but why were they so motivated to, to give it to you? Basically. They were retired and it was paid off and, you know, they were getting ready to go to Alaska and like some different cruises and things like that. And they had like two out of the three places occupied. They just didn't feel like getting the other one occupied. It's just like, they just wanted to be done. Like they just wanted to take their money if they got it as a lump sum and just be done with it. And like they had it for years and years and they got their money out of it. They're retired. They don't need the monthly income and their kids didn't want it. So it was just like, Hey, if anybody wants it, great. And I mean, and it wasn't in like the sexiest part of town. Like it was kind of like in the rental ish area close to a McDonald's. Like, you know what I mean? It's not like where I would want to live personally. So with that, it's like, they're not going to sell it to somebody who's going to want to live in there themselves because it's a triplex. Like, yeah, you could live in the one and rent out the other two, but it's not like you're going to have a better chance with me than you are finding that perfect buyer that is may not even exist. Mm-hmm. And you're helping them out, out tax wise as well, because they're not having to, is that, isn't that right? Like they, I don't want, I'm not an accountant and I can't like make me claims. either, but yeah, they're not getting that huge lump sum. So they're going to be getting it over however many years. And yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So I love that you're in that season where you're trying to find all the ways to structure a great deal. I want to talk about negotiation because I think if you've done sales long enough, you've, you've gotten good at negotiating, right? So I know for me, I love like, I love the art of negotiation because I think there is an art to it. What would you say for somebody that's listening in right now? Maybe they have a deal on their hands that they're interested in that maybe they want to do creative financing with, but they don't even know like how to own the conversation. Because that's where it is. Like, if you're going to be a good negotiator, you have to be the one in control, but you have to Mm -hmm. make the other person think that they're in control. (laughs) There's that's the art, right? So what would you say to that person? Like, how do they get good at negotiating? I think a lot of it is going to be based on your confidence. And a lot of your confidence is going to be based on your level of knowledge. So if you don't know creative, like if, if I've never heard of it, structured it, I'm not going to walk up to somebody and be like, Hey, I'm going to have you owner finance me? Like, I don't, like, I don't even know how you, like, if I've never talked about it, like, I don't want it. I would, you'd screw it up. You know what I mean? So you got to educate yourself, spend the time and figuring out like who does what, who, who says this, like, because you, if you are the one in control in this situation, you are going to be the real estate expert. So you need to know the answers to the questions that they're going to ask you, because a lot of it is going to be based on your, like their trust level is going to be based on how, how knowledgeable you seem like you're going to be because they're going to be like, well, I'm not going to like trust this like person who doesn't even understand it themselves. Like, I don't feel comfortable with that. But if you're like, no, you're, you hit like all the different answers that they ask you and then great. But then also figuring out like, what do they want? Like, what is, if they could have their ideal scenario, what is it? And then what is your ideal scenario? And then whenever you basically make an offer, I always give like an A or a B scenario. Like one of them is going to be kind of like, what I really want, you know, ish, you know, I'm always going to have like wiggle room in it, but then I'm going to basically structure it to where one is kind of like a suckier option. You know, like if it's going to be the $90,000 one, it's going to be like, you know, like there's like, for example, there's a woman that just reached out to me the other day, wanted to sell her house and it's an estate and things like that. I'm also an agent. So it's also like, you know, if I can't buy it, I'll list it. So, you know, she wanted, she didn't even have a price for it, but I basically, you know, after pulling comps, I'm like, it may make more sense for you just to list this because it's going to be like, you could list it for like 85 to a hundred thousand. And then you could make, it's all owned free and clear. I'm like, you could make like 80 to hundred K like easy all day long. She's like, but what would it be if you would buy it? I'm like, well, I'm like, well, if I would buy it as an investor, I'm like, I'll give you 25,000 cash. (laughs) So like, that's a sucky offer, right? you know what I mean? But she considered it, you know what I mean? And it, and it was so sucky that it got her to list her house. Like now she's mm-hmm. like, well, I better list it. Cause I'm like, I don't want that garbage of an offer. So, you know, really I wanted her to list it because it wasn't like the best house in the best area. Yeah. I could have probably made like 40 or 50 K on it because it only needed a couple little things. 
And then I could list it for the 80 to 100,000 myself. So if I could buy it for 20, put 10 into it and fix the couple things that sucked on it. And then basically here's where we're at, then I could have made like whatever it is. But I really I have another rehab getting ready that I'm getting ready to tackle. I have other things going on. And so it was just easy for me. And then I have an agent that I work hand in hand with. So we basically we we tag team on everything. So I say, here's my partner. She takes it from there. And then I'm getting half credit on all the listings. So I really just basically hand it off. And that's what I wanted. So, so I want to talk about two things here. One, going back to being competent about what you're talking about, right? So like knowing enough to then have the conversation. And I think that like, if I could look back on my years of making bad decisions and investing, it's that like, I tried to do things alone. Right. And I tried to like Mm -hmm. figure it out alone. And if you don't understand creative financing, that's a great time to go in with a partner. Would you say Jenna that knows and understands it? Yeah. So the way I look at it is if I'm going to do anything with kind of like a partner or somebody, I want that person to be like an extension of me of who I would be if I was in that role full time. Like I know I would be probably the top agent in my area if I actually focused on being a real estate agent as my full-time job, as my life, but I don't. Like that's just like a sliver. Like I have my license just to have it and I can list it if I want to, you know, or for a family member or something like that. I choose not to like list my own properties because I feel like it's, well, let me talk to the seller, which is me. It's kind of weird. You know, like the girl that I work with, she's a an agent in my brokerage. She's the top, one of the top agents there. And if I were to like pick anybody and I say who I would want to be, if I could be a full-time agent is her. Mm. She follows up. She's great. She's so knowledgeable. She does it full-time and she's a people pleaser and she's just, she's like, she's great. So to me, like you have to be able to know, like they say, like no one to hold them, no one to fold them, like no one to know that you suck at something. And so for me, I was sucky at being an agent because I'm not a full-time agent. So having her, she's an extension to where she can make me look really good because then she is the follow-up. She is the, the extension of myself that I would want to be if I took it on full time. So like finding people that do what you'd want to do if you gave it the time and had the energy to really put into it. Wow. That is gold right there. That is absolute gold right there. I love that. And somebody that could be an extension of you. Now, On that same caveat, when you're choosing to like, okay, we're going to go into business together. Are there some things that you have like with this, with this partner, with this real estate agent, I'm sure you have some caveats of like how the relationship is going to go. Yeah. I mean, it's just basically deciding like the percentage of the split and who's going to do what and who pays for what, who pays for the photographer, who does this. I mean, it's an even split. And especially it's like, the leads are coming in from me. So if it wouldn't be for me, there wouldn't be this lead. So anybody getting half of that to me is half of something you never were going to have anyways. So like, even if that's where I end and you begin and you take it all from there, well, then that's enough. But if I have the relationship, I'm walking you into the door. They say like, when you get an agent in a door, they have like, I don't remember the exact percentage, but like a 90 or 90 couple percent chance of getting that listing as a listing if it goes to be a listing. So if I'm like literally saying to this agent, I have the leads, I'm going to walk you in here. I'll introduce you to the person that I already know that I've already toured their house and I've given you like all the facts about it. I'm like setting them up for total success. So I may go there, I'll introduce them. And I'm like, here's my partner. We work together. See you later. (laughs) I'm not going to talk to you probably a lot because it's going to be then her. And then she's like the face that they deal with. And she'll let me know when it's closing. So, but I have total respect for her. So it's not like she's like my assistant at all. Like I look at her, like you are this agent. Like I, you know, I look up to her because without her, it's not going to happen because I'm just going to let the deal fall apart. So I may have the deal, but I'm okay to settle for 50% versus 0% because I wouldn't have had time to do anything with it. So we both would be sitting there with nothing if we didn't have each other. I think it's important that everybody understands you structure all that in the beginning. Okay. This is what the split's going to be. This is what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to do. People sometimes get into partnerships and don't have those conversations in the beginning. They say, oh, it's going to be great. And I'm going to bring you leads and then we'll figure it out. Don't do that because that's it's like a marriage. You know, like, would you want to be married to them? Would you want to be talking to that person a couple of times a week? If you don't like them, then don't be, don't be around them. You know, like, that's the thing is like, you're going to be dealing with that person. So if they're annoying, then, you know, if their follow-up sucks and, 
you know, all that kind of stuff. Like I've had so many agents that I've tried doing this with. And it's like the people would be like, oh, I never heard from your agent. Oh, they never called me back. They never put together this. And it's like, I'm not taking my leads that are golden and then just like giving them to somebody to throw away. I can do that myself right. and save myself the hassle. Wow. So your confidence to do all of this is like, it's top notch. I could just feel it. And I hope all of you can feel that. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you can probably see it on Jenna that she just, she walks her talk. And I know you're a faith-based person. You talk about in some of your like previous podcasts I've listened to that you've been on, you talk about how like you knew you were going to be a successful real estate investor one day and you just had to get through like the tough times and the setbacks. Is that because you are a person of faith? I would say probably a lot of that has to do with that. Plus like, um, I just always felt like I was different, but in the beginning, it wasn't like in a positive way. I just always felt like I was the weird kid. And I'm sure a lot of us can relate to I that. Totally like relate maybe, to that. I always say, I always call myself, I am the weirdo. I'm the problem. It's me. Yeah. Like, I mean, I didn't have a ton of friends. I didn't have all these different things. So because of that, I had to figure out ways to fill those voids. And a lot of it just was with self-talk. Like I, I didn't have a lot of people talking to me. So therefore my brain was filled with what I thought. And I always thought that I was different. I always thought that I had something different within me that not a lot of people had. And even like getting into real estate coaching and things like that. I remember like I was a student, then I became a coach. And I was like, when I became a coach, I'm like, I had no idea that students are this lazy. Like I, I figured everybody did their work. I figured everybody turned in their homework. I figured everybody did the things that you're supposed to. Like, I, you know, I went to 13 years of private Catholic school, you know, where it was like, you know, nuns there. And I mean, we went to church twice a week at school and, you know, on the weekends and like you wore uniforms and you did this and you kneeled. You, I mean, like that's, I was, I grew up very regimented like that mm -hmm. and a lot of respect and, you know, like was taught to me. And it, accountability is super big too. Like you say, you're going to do something, you do it, you show up. If you're not, if you're not going to do it, then don't commit to it kind of a thing. But I, I, I mean, I think it definitely is a lot of faith, faith based stuff. I mean, yeah, when you go through highs and lows, you can really lose your faith pretty easily if you don't have something strong to cling it to. But a lot of times when you bring it back, you see that like, man, I couldn't have got through that. And if there wasn't something else or there's no, there's no way I could have survived this had it not been for something else or someone else or whatever protecting me or guiding me. And even the things that are setbacks, it's almost like, well, man, that sucked going through it, but I'm so like, wow, that turned out better than I could have even expected it. Like I never would have planned for that. So thank goodness that didn't work out the way I had thought. Right. Now you were the person watching the you know, real estate shows on TV and you're over here, like blowing up your real estate investing career. And all of a sudden now you become an HGTV personality. Did, was that a goal of yours? Like, were you watching it one day and was like, okay, what can I do to get on HGTV? Did it just pop in your lap? Talk us through that story. Yeah. So that was never a goal. Like I'm like, like in real life, I'm super shy. Like if I'm confident about something, I'll answer your questions. But in real life, I'm like a very big introvert. I'm quiet. I'm reserved. And like being on stages, I've been on a ton of stages, but I'm like petrified to be on stage. Like as soon as I'm up there for a few minutes, I'm fine. But leading up to it, I'm petrified. So like being on TV, all that was like scary for me. And I had been given like a couple of different production companies had reached out to me in the beginning. I turned everything down. There was a guy that was on the show, like flip this house that had the show. And he reached out to me. He wanted to produce me. And I turned that down. There was a lot of things just because I felt like I wasn't ready in my business. Like I was such a newbie that like I screwed up because I put everything first. So I'm not going to put this first because I really don't have anything to show on TV because I wasn't prepared yet. But also like, I didn't have the time to detach from my business to film in addition to like getting everything else done. I didn't even have the time to get it done in the first place. So it was probably, you know, like three or four years into being in real estate. I was actually out in, in California at a training event and I get an email from somebody from HGTV directly. So a lot of times people like will have these like random little like production companies that will reach out and say like, I'm trying to pitch a show to HGTV and they kind of like need you to be like, you know, the guinea pig, the talent or whatever totally. to yeah. approach them. But they found me directly. And I asked him like, how did you guys even find me? And they said through your social media. So whatever they were looking for, I met that criteria. 
they were kind of looking for like that single mom kind of a thing with the historic houses and all that, whatever. So they reached out to me. They said, you know, send us, are you interested? And I'm like, yeah, I consider it. And they're like, send us like a 10 minute video clip of who you are, what you do and how you do it. And I was like, always like obnoxious with like taking videos and pictures of all my projects and my contractors. And they're all like country hillbillies and smoking cigarettes while they're like dumping gas cans. And it's just like a shit show. I mean, sorry, I don't know if we're swearing, Um, but it was just like, you know, it was just always like this country mess. And so it like, it caught their attention. So I basically like, you know, sent them that video. They're like, we love it. So they sent that, you know, a production team in, they said, we're going to film for a whole day. We did like, we filmed for like 13 hours. And we made this like little sizzle reel and then they positioned it to the, to HGTV that, you know, directly. And they said, we love it. So then that's when we, they came out like, you know, that was like October by June, we were filming for the whole month of June. And then after we filmed, they were like, you know, the hot shows are like these guy and girl duos, like, you know, like Chip and Joanna and that like Tarek and Christina. And like, so they basically wanted me to find a a male role and like, you know, bring somebody on and say I'm engaged and kind of like change like the real truth of my life. And so I declined it. So I ended up not, they, they, we could, I could have done more, but it just, it just wasn't, it wasn't something I sought out. And it wasn't something that I was like, oh my gosh, I want this for my life. So I did it. I checked it off. And then it's like, let me go back to doing what I was doing, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. Do you feel like it changed the process of how you flipped homes? Do you feel like it added value to your life in any way? I mean, it was super cool to say, but like in a small town, some, some of the people weren't very like super receptive of it. It would be like, Oh, are you that girl from TV? It's like, Oh my gosh. Like seriously, you know, like you get like a tiny little talent fee and all of a sudden everybody thinks you're a millionaire. You know, so, I mean, it, it was something cool to do. It made it a little harder actually for negotiating with people because everybody's like, oh, you're the HGTV person. You can pay more. So it actually took a while before people like cooled down a little bit and like started acting normal about it. So, I mean, it's not something I ever really lead with. Like, it's not something I'm like, oh, hey, I'm Jenna from HGTV from six years ago. Like nobody cares, you know, <laughs> but like, you know, it's, it's something cool to know it, but it, and it's, and it's so tangible and it's so doable for people. Like, I, I'm not saying anybody could go get a TV show, but like, it's really not that hard. I mean, I didn't seek it out, but it found me, but I'm sure if I'd want to do it again, all I'd have to do is reach back out to the people and be like, look how cool my life is now. And I have a, a second child. You may want to film him. He's even you know more into real estate than my daughter was. So, I mean, you could do so many cool things. It's just like, it is not on the top of my agenda right now in my life at all. Yeah. But this, that's interesting because I think that that persona was probably like, it probably did hinder the real estate investing right there. And I always think about for myself, you know, when I'm, I don't run any ads about like real estate, like buying homes or anything from my personal stuff, because people don't want to give you deals at all. Like even like I've posted on my personal Facebook, like, Hey, I'm buying 50 homes. And I got so many people, but all of them wanted to like charge me like retail. I'm like, this is not a deal here, but they all have it in their mind. Oh, mommy millionaire, like she has a ton of money, like, you know, like she can afford it. So Mm -hmm. I've gone about other ways now of helping. I'm doing a lot of JV deals with people and stuff like that, where teaching them how to brand themselves and attract in deals. But I do think it's interesting how people, if they know anything about your public personality, they're going to kind of go, oh, wait, (laughs) you know, they're going to have a a different, they're going to come into that negotiation different. So let's, let's uh, wrap this thing up. I want to talk about skills you need in real estate because to get started in real estate, I would say you need time, money, or knowledge of the industry, you know? So some people, you could be private money lenders and get into real estate without knowing anything. (laughs) Okay. And just like loan your money to people who know what they're doing. I don't recommend going that route because you should at least know enough to be dangerous to know if you're getting screwed over. Like there's so many things that can go wrong when you're lending your own money But I want to ask you, Jenna, for the person who has time to find the deals, learn about the industry, do you think anyone can do this? Or do you think that you need to have specific strengths to be successful at this? I guess to answer that is like there, I have no excuse for somebody who can't do this. Like, I think like I'm so on the side of anybody could do this that I don't even have a response to the other half of it because like I started out 
like I, I was pretty much freshly divorced. I, I was a mother of a two year old. So having a toddler that you're watching full time, you have primary custody of your child at that time, like things fell apart in my life. So I was living at my parents' house, you know, so I'm like living in my parents' house. I have this child that I'm trying to take care of. I have no real estate experience whatsoever. Like my, my brain is mental or, you know, like medical, you know, like medical sales, like all these different things. So I never had any real estate background. So, and I invest in like some of the poorest counties in Pennsylvania and I didn't have hardly like anybody local to me to help me. So like for me to, I'm not saying like, if I can do it, you can do it, but it all comes down to how bad do you want it? Like, you know, and also like in this industry, it's like, it's a very like fine line between in regards to self-control, because you have to have emotions with this, but also you have to be emotionless when it comes to other, like when it comes to some things, like you have to know how to detach yourself and you have to know how to be sympathetic towards people. So you have to be, you know, you have to be a person. It's always like people first, money second. So when you do this, you just basically have to go into it. If you have the time to do it, then heck yeah, like spend your time, educate yourself, surround yourself with the right people, start tagging yourself with these, with these people, go to these events and start being associated with these different people, you know, and then everybody's going to associate with you with them. And then all of a sudden you have instant credibility. If there's somebody out there that has the money to do this, but not the time, then find somebody like person A that we just talked about that has all the time in the world and work together with that person. Somebody who's hungry, somebody who wants to do this, somebody who's not lazy and then give them like a couple like minor assignments, like here, do this, do that, do this. And if they can't do it, if they're not accountable, if they don't do what they say they're going to do, they don't show up when they're going to, when they say they're going to show up. I don't want somebody like that in my business or in my life, because I need somebody I can count on. Because if, if you can count on me, I can count on you kind of a thing. So good. Oh my goodness. So good. Well, okay. That, that just like wrapped on the last couple of questions I had, because I like what you're talking about when, I mean, I don't like the fact that people are lazy, but that is a fact is that a lot of people are lazy. A lot of people say they want to do things, but when it comes down to it, they don't do it. I mean, I have people buy programs all the time. I mean, you were just on a call that we did and it's like yeah. one person shows up. I'm like, how do you pay money for something and then not show up for it? Like, I'm just not that person. You know, I always show up for those things. Like, I don't, I don't care because I'm interested. I'm hungry and learning not only learning, but also taking action on it. So I think that lazy people don't want to be lazy. People are lazy because it's actually like a trauma response. They mm -hmm. like become so paralyzed. They're like in fight or flight and they've just stopped like fighting. Frozen. Yeah. They just can't do anything. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to that person? Because I know that there's has to be at least one person listening in right now that might be like, gosh, like, yeah, I've been learning on podcasts. I've been reading the books on real estate investing. I've even bought a program, but I haven't done anything with it yet. What would you say to that person? I'd say like in that situation, it all comes down to having somebody like, if you're not going to hold yourself accountable, then you're going to have to find somebody that's going to hold you accountable. Like if you can't trust yourself to do what you say you're going to do, then you're gonna have to find somebody who's going to push you somebody like you, because like, if I say I want to do this and it ends up being like, I don't show up on the calls and I don't do the curriculum that you teach me and I don't follow up with you, there's not much you can do. Like you can't wake me say like, Jenna, it's time to wake up. It's time to make your phone calls. You know, you can't be here in the morning and say like, Hey, you need to follow up with these leads. Like, I mean, yeah, there's an extent of like some of the things you can do, but like forcing yourself to be surrounded by somebody that, you know, that's going to kick you in the butt, like a crack the whip kind of a person like you that if I say like, all right, if I'm spending X amount of money for this program, you know what I want to accomplish. And if I'm not diligent or self-motivated enough to do it or want it, then I need you to remind me by cracking that whip. I need you to tell me, remind me my why or whatever it is, or put things on a wall or, you know, and figuring out what the goals are. Like, we don't all just like jump in the car and be like, oh, let's see where we end up today. And it goes the same way with our real estate career. Like we need to figure out where are we going? Where is the long-term plan? Because therefore then I can get in my car with enough time to get there and enough gas to get there and plan it out and have snacks or whatever so I can get there. But if I just wing it and say, all right, let's just see what happens. Well, then you're going to get exactly that, like total chaos and no organization and nothing accomplished. Wow. Okay. I love it. I am thinking right now, I'm like in my programs, I'm like, how do I increase more accountability? I know one girl that's in a mastermind. I think we're in the same, it's the girl that at the event, I can't remember what her name is, but she said, if people get on a call late, she locks them out of the call. 
like she's like crazy like that. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that level. But I think they're like sometimes people need that like amount of accountability in place. Like I know for me, if I was in her program, I'd be kicked out because I'm like all the time. Oh, it's bad. Anyway, but thinking about that for you coaches listening in right now or anybody that helps people, it's like, how do you increase accountability inside of your program? So that way you're making sure people get results because people, people need help in the beginning, especially if they've been paralyzed for so long. They just really do. So where do you see yourself in five years? In five years, I plan to have probably at least doubled my rentals. I want to have more Airbnbs. I plan to have a lot of things just kind of on autopilot. Like I plan to have my team expanded quite a bit more, you know, to where I'm doing more of the things that I want to do. I really enjoy certain parts of real estate that maybe some people don't like. Like I love the interaction with people. I love going to the houses every day and taking pictures of the progress. Like I love the marketing side of it. Whereas some people are like, I don't even know what to post on social media. Like I don't, I don't have that like creative side, but that's the stuff that like I live for, you know? And so getting more people in place to where I'm able to detach more but still like have that influence over them that they are a direct reflection of me within my business. You know, my daughter, she's going to be 13. So in five years, like, I mean, she's going to be getting to the age where, you know, I want to have, um, you know, different rentals in her and my son's names. I want to have, you know, cause like, you know, most people are like, you know, when you, when you, your kids, like, you know, they're in school and things like that, you know, like it's always such a competition with other kids and things like that. And, you know, she's always like, well, this person has this and this person has that. And I'm like, well, the ultimate flex is going to be when you have all these rentals and you have all these great things and you are educated and you know how to, you know, do all these like, you know, really cool things. Like I don't necessarily want to hand all my rentals to my kids. I will, but I also want to teach them how to do it themselves. So they're not little snots when they grow up, you know? Oh my gosh. Absolutely. You're talking to the girl who lives in Newport. Well, we're, we're transplants here, but I mean, there's a lot of that, like, you know, people who have been handed yeah. things and it's just a different mindset. And I love your daughter's turning 13. My son just turned 13. So maybe arranged marriage in the future. <laughs> you I, need to do yeah. that. Yeah. I, I always talk about that, like with my girlfriends, because we all kind of have kids the same age. I'm like, we need to figure out to, how to arrange all these marriages because this type of thinking, you know, where it's like, we want hardworking, like that ethic inside of people. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of, it could be lost in five years from now, you know, like when our kids are like, we're going to get married in 10 years. Like I want to make sure to put my kids in those bubbles of people who have that same moral compass and the hardworking values, you know? Yeah. That's kind of where I'm at. Like, I really want to do real estate, but I also am into like health and fitness and wellness. So I like, you know, I kind of want to learn more about that, spend my time there while having my real estate stuff all autopilot. I love it. Well, I know we'll be doing a lot of that together because we're on that same, just that same trajectory of where we want to be in five years. So I'm really excited and just thankful that you came on the podcast today and taught everybody, like we talked about so many different things. I feel like there's so many nuggets. People are going to have to go back and listen to this a couple of times because there's so many good things, but where can people follow you? I'm on all social, social media at, at Jenna buys houses. So J E N N A and buys is plural. So B U Y S and then houses is plural. So H O U S E S. So at Jenna buys houses and all the different realms. All right. And we'll link up all of her social media channels on the show notes in both platforms, that, wherever you're listening to this. So Jenna, thank you so much for um, helping me in my real estate investing career and also just helping so many other people. I'm really excited to see you shine and to see your kids just really blossom too into real estate investors one day. Thanks for having me. And I'm sure I'll be seeing you.